Hello, welcome to New Bedford Lights Chat. Today's uh, version of the chat, my guests are Lee Blake, the longtime president of the New Bedford Historical Society, and Tim Walker, who is a UMass Dartmouth professor. I'm very excited about this chat, which is gonna be devoted to the Underground Railroad and the new Abolition Row Park, uh, slated to open in New Bedford in the near future, under construction now. And we're also gonna to explore today some of the great work that Tim and other uh, academics did on um, bring to light the uh, prevalence of the maritime escape routes in the Underground Railroad, including to New Bedford. So um, welcome, Lee. I should, I should mention that um, Lee is a, a longtime researcher and, and grant writer for the city, uh, for the city's um, African-American um, exhibits, including the Paul Cuffey Park and other things, and now the Abolition Row Park. Uh, Tim uh, was the editor of uh, Sailing to Freedom, a collection of essays and research about the important role that Maritime Escape played in the Underground Railroad, as well as a history professor over at UMass Dartmouth. So welcome, Lee, and welcome, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that Tim and I have worked together on National Endowment for the Humanities grants and programs teaching teachers the history of the Underground Railroad for 15 years. Huh. Well, some of that great work is uh, coming to fruition now, I think, uh, with uh, this great exhibit and also the park coming. So, um, Lee, can you talk about uh, the park a little bit and uh, how it came about, what, where the idea came from, and what its role will be in telling New Bedford's uh, role in the Underground Railroad? Well, the New Bedford Historical Society members um, have the Nathan and Polly Johnson House, which is on Spring Street, right across the street from the Friends Meeting House. And over the years, we've been able to help that neighborhood actually put together three national historic sites right on that corner of Spring and, and 7th Street. And because of uh, a fire, the two houses across the street from the Johnson House burned down. And we had this huge lot there. And, you know, people drive by, they throw garbage in the lot. It was really awful for us as a historical society promoting African-American historic places and the importance of the Johnson House, which is where Frederick Douglass lived, but also a number of uh, individuals who would escape slavery it was an underground railroad house. And instead we had fish heads and garbage across the street. So it really was uh, a way for us to think about how we could imagine a historical campus on 7th and Spring Street. And we were able to convince the city to help us put a park there. So now we are doing Abolition Row Park the uh, Spring Street and 7th Street area, they have 19 historic homes that are all in good shape, that uh, reference to captains, uh, whaling captains, um, abolitionists, Quakers that lived on that street who were involved in the abolitionist movement. Um, it is not a story that New Bedford had told about how important the Underground Railroad was with the maritime trades. And with Tim and myself working on that, other members of the Historical Society coming forth with the stories of their families coming here by boat. Um, people always think of the Underground Railroad, of course, as underground, which it's not, but overground. And we were able to connect the whaling industry and all the sailing up and down the coast, the coastal trades with the Underground Railroad with the number of people who came to New Bedford, first of all for jobs, but also for safety and security, because Massachusetts is one of the first states that end slavery. I'm very excited that you referred to it um, as a campus, because I think that that has long been needed. And we have the, um, the campus, so to speak, of the Whaling Museum down in the historical district. But I think the Underground Railroad has not had its own campus. And I think this will be very exciting. In fact, I think Brendan, you can put up some of the photos of um, the Abolition uh, Row Park, which is under construction um, up there on 7th Street. Um, as Lee pointed out, there are 
many historical houses on that street where whaling captains lived. Um, will it be a, um, is the plan lead for a seamless experience in terms of you uh, go up to the park and you go into the, the um, Nathan and Polly Johnson house? How, 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 how do you hope it will work? So you're, you're looking at, you know, some of the granite posts, the, um, the gazebo. So when you say seamless, we're thinking that the park will become programming space. So it'll be a park and this tree that we're looking at was just planted. The park will have cherry trees around it so that people will wanna come to the park to see what stage the cherry trees are in, just like they do in Washington, except ours won't be as many. But the gazebo will be ha an opportunity for the symphony has already offered to do music there. People can do poetry slams there, but it'll be space that people can utilize to really connect the city's experience on a whole different area, number of areas there in the park, right across the street from the Johnson House. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, the statue of Frederick Douglass, uh, which came up for a bit, which is uh, an image of Douglas that we don't see that often. He's a young man and he looks like he's been working down in the docks. So one of the things that the historical society managed was a series of conversations and discussions with people about saving black spaces. Um, in uh, about four years ago, we actually did an exhibit on saving black spaces that was brought to Boston at the architectural college. And having the conversation about what people wanted to see in a park, what people wanted to see in a statue of Douglas. You know, everybody knows Douglas as, you know, the elder statesman. But when he came to New Bedford, he was 20. And he was just beginning his life as a person who had not been enslaved for his whole life. He was a free man. And he really got a foundation from New Bedford on what it would be like to be a free African-American in Massachusetts, not necessarily around the country, but certainly in Massachusetts. And he has the opportunity to work on the docks. And initially um, the Irish who are also immigrants at the time didn't really want him there, but the Quaker owners of the boats said, if you, just, if you don't work with him, you don't work for us. So there's some of that pushback, but Douglas comes here, he's 20, he starts going to the churches, he and his wife Anna start to plan a family, and they start to think about what their life could be like as free individuals. So the statue that you see here, it's um, being burnished uh, with the heat so that it'll be a little polished, but it is Douglas in the clothes of a sailor, um, when you look at this, you really see Douglas's whole life. In his hand is a copy of the Liberator magazine, which he wrote for, and North Star. He also was a journalist and he had his own publications. And the cane is a, um, an example of the cane that was given to Douglas as an elder statesman by Mary Todd Lincoln after the death of Abraham Lincoln. So you really see Douglas as a young man all the way until his, his life as a Washington uh, outsider in that one piece. And uh, he worked as a caulker when he was enslaved in Maryland. And that, that brings us to this maritime connection. You know, uh, New Bedford was a, a natural place to, 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 to come from. Tim, did, did was New Bedford a port that, um, people who were escaping by sea came directly to, or, or was it uh, places like New York and, and further south, and then they came here later? Both could have happened, and both did happen. Um, one of the things about New Bedford, uh, we remember it, of course, as the center of whaling, but it was also one of the major East Coast ports of the United States in the late 18th and early 19th century for all kinds of commerce and trade. I mean, one of the, some of the the geographic elements that make New Bedford uh, an important port today, that it's a deep water protected port, uh, made it attractive to mariners 200 and 300 years ago. Uh, 
And so New Bedford was a place uh, that was actively trading with merchant ships up and down the East Coast, um, usually small ones, schooners and brigs and sloops. But um, these are vessels that were not necessarily going out and were not going out for whaling. They were going to trade with all of the various ports along the East Coast and down into the Caribbean. And what that gave then was an opportunity for people to escape from the South uh, northward. And some of them would come directly to New Bedford or Westport or Mattapoisett. And others would um, come overland part of the way, maybe um, sailing to, say, um, Boston or to New York or to Newport, as uh, Frederick Douglass does, and then making his way by land onward to uh, New Bedford. I, I remember I came ac across um, uh, someone who uh, was uh, uh, working in Dart Dartmouth, um, uh, who came, was it John Maslow? Uh, this is from the exhibit that was at the Whaling Museum. He was the son of a, a white planter and enslaved woman born in South Carolina, came north to Dartmouth, and he had skills as a shipwright. And became part owner of a, a shipbuilding right. company. It, it, it seems like it was just a regional wide thing. Well, it's it's not just that it was regional wide. As as Tim talks about the ships going up and down the coast carrying goods, there are other things that they were carrying. They were carrying broadsides. They were carrying information about what it's like for black people in other parts of the country. Um, we know that some of the abolitionists, the black abolitionists, had a broadside sewn into the clothes of sailing sailors so they could pass that information out. New Bedford all begins to get a reputation because people are talking, African-American sailors are talking about how Massachusetts is freer than many of other states. So, for instance, New Bedford always was able to say no one was ever kidnapped and reclaimed from New Bedford. Now that's not something Boston could say, certainly not something New York could say because New York had kidnappers all over the place who kidnapped free as well as enslaved blacks and sold them back to, down south. But that did not happen in New Bedford. It's interesting. So even though you had the white Irish caucus who did not want Douglas working with them and getting those jobs, and I imagine other Blacks. Uh, but you also had a uh, an atmosphere here where they were not as vulnerable to kidnapping and, and return to the South. Right. I think it's fair to say that the tone of the city as an abolitionist stronghold was set first by the owners of the whaling vessels, the, the people who were Quakers, Society of Friends who came from Nantucket, but as the African-American population grew, African-Americans became extremely important in the local abolitionist uh, structure and networks. And they worked together and, and they worked individually to uh, encourage people to come to New Bedford, which is why it earned the, the nickname, uh, the Fugitives Gibraltar, which was a commonplace um, a nickname that was used in the, in the 19th century and then became the the title of a wonderful book uh, based on the research by Catherine Grover uh, that she wrote. And, and she sort of uh, revived the name as the title of her book because it, it uh, so accurately demonstrated uh, the way uh, abolitionists at the time, and especially African-American ones, thought about uh, New Bedford as a place that was secure and safe and where they could get a, um, uh, they could make a living and, and build a life. And there are certainly are a number of uh, narratives that were done by enslaved people who write about the possibilities of New Bedford. People would run away, come to New Bedford. They had an opportunity for jobs here. There was always a need on the shipping sloops and on the whaling ships for green hands. And green hands meant anybody who was willing to work because whalers, how long did you want to be a whaler? You didn't want your whole life to be like that it was first of all, you just wouldn't make it. So there's always this turnover of a need for new people. So that's one reason why the black community was brought here and the Cape Verdean community later on is that there was always a need for people to come and work the ships, whether it was going out for whaling or whether they were going up and down the coast to deliver goods. And in fact, as we saw with the recovery this year in the Gulf of Mexico of that, 
uh, ship that had uh, sunk there. Uh, working on ships uh, in general was an area, one of the few areas in American commerce that blacks could succeed and move up in, um, including in New Bedford and Westport, places like that. One of the books that um, sort of gave rise to this project was a work that was done by a historian in the late 90s, a guy called Jeffrey Bolster, who was a licensed sea captain, but he taught history at the University of New Hampshire. And he wrote a book, a great book called Blackjacks. And what he demonstrated in that book is that almost a fifth of the entire seagoing labor population, all of the mariners who were working on American flagged vessels in the first quarter, uh, first half of the 19th century, about a fifth of them were people of color. Uh, and some of them were free African-American men. A lot of them were enslaved, especially in the South, who were paying their wages to their owners. But, but they were building these maritime skills and the maritime knowledge that made them much more cosmopolitan and much more knowledgeable about the world than someone working inland uh, in agricultural work as an enslaved person. And you always have to remember that um, when we look at the history of, of our area, that the Native American people were whalers. So you have the Wampanoag and the Micmacs, they were whalers. They showed the Puritans about blackfish. What were blackfish? They were whales. So there was always that um, element of the marginalized communities working as workers on the ships because there weren't that many white individuals at the time who had the skills or were numerous enough to people all the ships that came into New Bedford. New Bedford had just an incredible number of ships that all needed to be manned. And no one cared what color they were if they were skilled. It's just this great story of, it's so New Bedford, both from the um, uh, the portraits of the Native Americans in the, um, escaped enslaved people and the, the whole connection to the whaling industry is just all fascinating. Tim, Tim, you have a background as a maritime historian. How did how did you begin to focus on maritime escape as something that was underappreciated or reported? Yeah, so the, the funny thing about the arc of my career is that I wasn't a historian who focused much on whaling or uh, or slavery in the in the uh, in the US context. So I came to New Bedford as a historian of the Portuguese world, and I had spent a lot of time uh, working with Portuguese sources and, and working in Lisbon, but I was also a maritime historian, generally uh, focused on European colonial expansion and the maritime skills that allowed for colonization all over the world by the Portuguese or the Spanish or the Dutch or you know, anyone you can, you can name. But when I got to New Bedford, I lived right downtown. I lived within sight of the Whaling Museum. Uh, and I came here first as a crew to, to be a crewman aboard uh, the uh, schooner Ernestina in the 90s. That's how I got to know New Bedford the first time. So when I got a job at UMass Dartmouth, I, I wanted to live in New Bedford. And I got to know, you know folks at the Whaling Museum. The, uh, Michael Dyer became a friend. And, uh, and, and this opened up a world for me of the kind of records Mm -hmm. extraordinary documentation that's available in New Bedford, in the holdings of the uh, New Bedford Whaling Museum and the New Bedford Free Public Library and other places, private collections such as those uh, owned by the New Bedford Historical Society and Lee Blake's family and Carl Cruz and all these folks around town who just have incredible historical stuff. But I had started sailing when I was in graduate school because I wanted to learn firsthand kind of viscerally what uh, what sailing on a large historically rigged vessel was like. Uh, and that then gave me some insights into how escapes might have happened by water once we began to be aware that this was actually happening in very large numbers. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I was born in Detroit and I grew up in Ohio. And that part of the world is, of course, um, the Underground Railroad is an extraordinarily important story there as well, but people only focus on the overland terrestrial right. side of the escapes. And so when I moved to the East Coast, I went to Boston for grad school and then came to New Bedford. I really started to appreciate that if you wanted to escape from the far south, the way to do that was by ship, not overland. Going overland was just too far. 
So Tim, you, you have uh, brought with you today a, a slideshow that's going to help us walk through a little bit of um, the maritime research. So I wonder if you can start that now and leave. Feel, feel free to comment as um, Tim's slides come up uh, about the New Bedford connections. Great, thank you. So I'll start. This is the cover of the book that um, that came out last year that was done uh, in part because of the collaboration that I did with Lee Blake and the New Bedford Historical Society and getting funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities to bring um, teachers from all over the United States. We brought them to New Bedford uh, between 2011 and 2022 now. Uh, and we've, we've brought in, gosh, over 200 people uh, right. well over that, maybe even close to 300 that have come from, you know, pretty much every state in the union. But here's the story. Um, this is the map that uh, is a National Geographic map that sort of shows how the Underground Railroad is taught in the United States. And there are some problems conceptually with this map. One of the big problems is that it shows people escaping over land from the very far south, from Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and the Carolinas, and they're going overland according to this map. But the, the, the historical fact is actually quite different. Um, all of the documented successful escapes over land began within just a day or two's walk from a border with a free state. Mm -hmm. So people are escaping over land out of Maryland and Delaware and West Virginia and Northern Virginia and Northern Kentucky and uh, Eastern Missouri, but they're not escaping from very far south because it was just too difficult to do that. Uh, the logistics were hard. People didn't know the way. The chances of getting caught were very, very high. And so overland escapes uh, from very far away from free states simply weren't happening with the uh, frequency that is often taught in the Underground Railroad. By contrast, though, if you could get on a ship from one of the southern ports like Savannah or Charleston or, you know, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, or, you know, any of the areas in the Chesapeake, if you could get on a ship and then get on a vessel three miles offshore, you were beyond uh, federal legal authority at that point, and you could get into the Gulf Stream and head north, within a matter of just a few days, you can sail from the far south southern coast uh, to a free state in the north. And so almost all of the escapes from the far south that are documented as successful, they happen from the coastal far south, and they happen by water with people escaping by sea. And how many people came from the far south versus the, the, the near south? Um, you know, that's a, so that's a great question. It's a question we get a lot. You know, what are the numbers? How can we compare them? Um, there are a couple of indicators, but one thing to remember is that this is illegal activity and it is clandestine and nobody told their story or very few people told their story because they were afraid of implicating anyone who helped them. And if they went public with their story before the Civil War, they could be then captured and retaken back into uh, slavery by bounty hunters. And so we don't have a lot of very clear in, in, indications uh, that are that are firsthand accounts, and it's really hard to quantify. But we do have a lot of data that shows us that this was happening. So here are some numbers. Um, there are about 120 published uh, narratives of uh, people who escaped, who published their stories uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Of those, about 70% uh, mention escape by water. We also have about 220,000 runaway slave ads. And while we haven't been able to yet um, gather them all together and systematically analyze them, there are hundreds and hundreds that mention people escaping by water. Uh, and the percentage of them is actually pretty high that, 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 uh, that mention escape by water. Are you, we, are you more likely to have been documented if you escaped by water? Um, I don't think that there's... I don't think there's a way to really make that statement because people, again, are keeping their stories uh, quiet until well after the, the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation, when you start to see people publishing their accounts. And then when the published accounts start to come out, the well, overwhelming majority of those published accounts mention escape by sea, by water. But as, you, but as you said, it was quicker and safer. It's quicker, it's safer, it, it requires far less effort once you're aboard a vessel, if, especially if you're aboard with the cooperation of the captain and crew, if they know you're there, then you just, all you have to do is 
go along for the ride until you get to a northern port. But if you're uh, a true um, stowaway and you have to remain hidden, or maybe you've stowed away with the help of one crew member and the captain doesn't know, then you have to remain hidden for the duration of the voyage. And that happened as well. And there are a lot of reports when you talk about reading the narratives, people talk about their close encounters, um, women who dressed up as men, who got on ships, who might have been smoked out. There were policies in some towns along the coast that they would smoke a ship before they would let it go, just to see if any fugitives came running out. So there are, there are these dangerous areas, even on ships. And the thing that we really wanted to talk about, and that's in terms of the historical society, is the agency of African-Americans who worked so hard to escape. It wasn't always just white people trying to save us. We were saving ourselves. And people, that's one thing we talk about. And one of the things that was really important for the historical society to do the work that we've been doing for the last 20 years, 25 years actually, is to tell the story of how African-Americans, Cape Verdeans and Native Americans worked hard to save themselves and to move the country closer to the ideals of democracy that the constitution talks about. Yeah, yeah I wonder if you can expand upon that a little bit, Lee, because I think it's a concept that is really important and timely and, and, and that is that African Americans were the prime movers of their escapes, and and it was you often hear uh, uh, about you know um, well, well the old the old cliche when we were growing up Lincoln freed the slaves or or, or John Brown or or, or, or or William Garrison these things the African American community in fact including in New Bedford was very very active. Well, that's one of the important items of Abolition Row Park is that Abolition Row Park is going to tell the story of African Americans who worked together with their allies in the white community to uh, organize, to actually belong to the Black Convention movement, which met across the, the free states. Black people would come together on a yearly basis to try to figure out different ways to work the system, to work the constitution, to try and free more states and more people. So people were thinking about ways to do these things, ways that they could come together collectively, use leverage with, with white allies to free African-Americans. And New Bedford has some great stories of the black women community who would organize and raise money to buy the freedom of other women who they knew were in danger because they were being sold to New Orleans. And everybody knows, everybody laughs and talks about New Orleans, but if you were a black enslaved woman at the time, you were being sold for sexual slavery, even though that's not what people talked about. So women here in New Bedford would work over the winters, over the summer months, knit, and have fairs where they would raise money to buy other people's freedom. Yeah, there, there, there was a, <laughs> yeah, there was an important story about about um, was it Nathan Johnson and uh, um, a young girl who was 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 there was there was concern that she was going to be sold um, in Rhode Island out of Rhode Island. Well, it's a whole family. It's the Gibson family. So the um, the Gibson family. There are uh, Mary and uh, three daughters and a son. They are brought to New Bedford by Patrick Gibson. Patrick Gibson is a, a wealthy Georgia plantation owner. He uh, brings them here because, first of all, he wanted, of course, his family not to be enslaved, A, but B, because New Bedford had integrated schools. He wanted his children to be able to learn how to read and write. So and these are his children with an enslaved woman. That's right. So she is his concubine, as uh, that's what she was called. And he brings her here and he supports her. So he sends her money every quarter. And one of the great things, as Tim mentioned, about uh, our uh, material culture is we have the letters that he wrote to his concubine, his family, to Nathan, et cetera, all at the library. 
So you can read the letters where he uh, exhibits his care and concern for these people. He was sending them $1,200 every three months. That's an incredible uh, fee. And what essentially what happens is after a number of years, after three years, he dies. And the status of the young women and his concubine all come up because his estate wants to take them back and resell them. And the New Bedford community organizes around them without going into all great detail. There's a lot of organizing to save those people. And yeah. they are saved, although Nathan Johnson is arrested for kidnapping. But that, again, the allies, the white allies here, the lawyers help him get out of that situation. But there are several stories like that here in New Bedford. The great, fabulous yeah. stories about how people banded together working with African-Americans, African-Americans who had different kinds of societies that were protecting free Blacks as well as enslaved Blacks. Yeah. It's fascinating. And I, I really think this new campus is going to really help to tell some of these stories in, in greater detail. Tim, we got off track a little bit. Bring us back to the waterfront. So uh, just to move through the, the sort of explanation of how this whole Underground Railroad by sea worked, the real key to understanding it is that uh, on the waterfronts of the South, uh, such as you see pictured here, uh, all of the labor, almost all of the waterfront labor and the shipboard labor is enslaved African-Americans. And so they're doing all of the jobs necessary to keep ships afloat and to move cargo and goods in and out of Southern ports. So what are they doing? They are the waterfront dock and wharf workers. They are teamsters. Uh, hauling carts of goods, provisions to the ships. There are longshoremen and stevedores that are loading and unloading ships. And these, you know, this is pretty skilled labor because a ship has to be loaded properly in order to keep the sailing trim and its sailing properties correct. But if I can um, just interrupt for a second, that 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 image of of the waterfronts of the South being almost totally staffed by enslaved people doing complex uh, uh, shipping and uh, 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 loading businesses is so different from the, the the image that we get of the agricultural workers doing very very simple work. It's a very different imp image of slavery than we than we're accustomed to. I think. I think that's a that's a fair point. The way uh, slavery is usually taught in the United States, the focus is on plantations, but in fact, enslaved people were doing all kinds of work, and a lot of it was very very skilled. So, for example, the um, the maintenance work and the rigging work and sail making and, and all of the various things that are necessary on a waterfront, a lot of that work is being done sometimes under direction of a, of a, of a, um, a master um, uh, artisan, but often not. And, you know, many of the African-Americans themselves became master artisans in these maritime crafts, but they're not only working on the waterfront, they're also working uh, on the water itself, as watermen uh, doing fishing, they are um, they are oystermen. They're working on ferries uh, because there were very few roads and there were very few bridges, and so ferries were important all throughout uh, uh, the United States in the waterfronts, north and south. Um, they're working on lighters, loading and unloading ships that are on a mooring or in an anchorage out in the harbor, and many of them are skilled deckhands and even pilots that. Um, that navigate large vessels in and out of the southern ports. So this labor provides strategic knowledge that then the enslaved population can leverage to escape. And Lee referenced this earlier, but the other way that we know this is happening a lot is that every southern port and every southern state enacted very strong laws to try to stop escapes by water from happening. So they're searching vessels that before they clear harbor, the vessels have to be searched. Many of them need to be fumigated. Um, African-American sailors who were freemen were often incarcerated or restricted to the ship uh, when they're in a Southern port because the Southern owner class is absolutely terrified that free black sailors are going to incite their enslaved property to run away. And so this happens uh, that we see, you can look on the, the legal codes of the South and see again and again and again that they're enacting these very strict laws with, with serious punishment. It was 
for a free black man in the South to help someone to escape was a capital offense. Uh, in the, have in the have, have um, scholars in, uncovered evidence that um, both free black men and enslaved black men working on the waterfront facilitated the hiding of of enslaved people as they sought to escape? Well, again, the, there, there are lots of stories. Sorry. Yeah, there are lots of stories that emerge after the Civil War, but because of the penalties prior to this, a lot of that was kept quiet before uh, before it, it wasn't a danger anymore in the uh, 1870s and 1880s. So I'd also like to reference the uh, remark that Tim made about how slavery is taught. And, and that's a, a discussion that's going on right now with the uh, CRT issues. But, you know, when slavery is developed in this country, people actually who were, were slave owners actually went to different parts of Africa and identified populations that they wanted to kidnap. So for instance, you have people who were skilled in raising rice. They were kidnapped and they were enslaved and brought here to start the right rice growing. Indigo was another thing. So you have people who actually looked at the coast of Africa and made decisions about what people they wanted because of their skills to come to the new world and you know to Brazil and other places where slavery was much more prevalent. So those things are not taught. And one of the, the benefits of what Tim and I do is we teach a more nuanced aspect of the enslaved experience. The maritime trade is just one dimension, but the whole idea that people use slavery to uh, denigrate people by saying, well, you know, they work in the fields because they're not that bright, but we were the owners of free organizations. We were the individuals who did the crafts work, the, the pottery. Uh, when you read things like Thomas Jefferson's um, experience running nails and making all of the different accoutrements that he needed for his buildings, those are all built by young black men. Wasn't, wasn't Jefferson doing them? And that's one of the things about slavery is that white people enslaved black people to do the work and then they belittled them and diminished the skills that they needed to do the work and that became stereotypes. One of, the, one of the important byproducts for this whole process that's important to New Bedford is that many of the people who are escaping from the waterfronts and the, and the waterborne jobs of the far south they arrive to New Bedford with all of these skills that they can immediately put to work in the whaling industry. So a lot of the African-Americans who come to New Bedford, they are not green hands. They're not novices. They have skills that they've learned uh, working on the waterfront and working on the water in the deep south. Um, just very quickly, a couple of other very fast slides. This shows you where the um, enslaved population was concentrated in just one state in South Carolina, but you see that all of these waterways and the way to bring the goods that are produced on the plantations down to the ports where they can be loaded on bigger ships and sent out to markets, all of that uh, work was done with boats, bringing uh, agricultural products from the plantations to the harbors, then loaded onto bigger ships and all that work, the, 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 the transportation work by boat, uh, and the loading and the unloading of ships, it's all being done by enslaved African-Americans. I Tim, mentioned- the, uh, the DACA, If we go back to that slide, Brendan, the, 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 um, the DACA areas would be where the larger populations of enslaved people were? Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, to, on the order of sometimes 70 or 80% of the entire population. So there were large African-American majorities uh, along these waterfront areas in Tidewater, South Carolina and North Carolina. That, that's where people would, would would want to escape from. Right. I mean, that's it just it, if once you know the sort of demographic and economic circumstances of the waterfront of the far south, it makes sense that hundreds and hundreds of people annually are escaping by water. But it's just a part of the story that in the 20th century, anyway, historians didn't focus on 
the Maritime Underground Railroad. They focused on the overland terrestrial side. And so our job, Lee and I, is to try to change the way people think about the Underground Railroad and try to really focus on this extremely important maritime dimension that often isn't uh, included in the story at all. So we also work with other historians in um, Virginia and South Carolina, um, tracing the names of people who left their particular state or city and came to New Bedford. So we are lucky because we have some of those records in our public library and also in the Whaling Museum. But people are uh, kind of reorienting and rediscovering this whole component of the Underground Railroad and the, the ability for people to move so much quicker and easier up and down the coast and the number of free people who came or people who became free once they got to New Bedford and how they were treated here. Yeah, and I, I imagine that there was research to be done uh, with the, the, the crew logs and things like that as to what exactly African-American men were doing and escaped enslaved people were doing on the ships and in the various industries. Yes, and that's being done now. There's a, a lot of um, active research going on in the New Bedford communities around women of color and how women of color were working with the, uh, the abolitionist movement. Also, the log books are being reviewed by individuals. But, but, you know, that's really part of the role of the historical society as advocates, that we were important, and African Americans, Cape Verdeans, and West Indians we were an important part of the whaling industry and an important part of the abolitionist industry. So as we uh, advocate for a better sense and understanding of African history, we've really kind of pushed that agenda forward. And it's happening in other parts of the country. It's not just New Bedford. It's happening in other parts of the country. Um, the federal government is involved with like the National Endowment for the Humanities. But there are lots of initiatives to tell a clearer, more representative history of the country that we live in. Uh, Lee, I have a couple of um, uh, uh, escaped uh, enslaved women who came to New Bedford uh, who are well known. And um, I, I noticed uh, down at Tim's exhibit, um, one is Harriet Jacobs who fled Virginia, who fled North Carolina on a ship for Philadelphia and Amelia Johnson Piper fled Virginia on a schooner. Can, can you folks talk about those two? Uh, Harriet Jacobs and Amelia Johnson Piper? Well, uh, I, I can talk about both of them. Um, okay. Tim, why don't you talk about John Jacobs? Because there's, the, there's a whole slew of Jacobs that come. Yeah. And uh, Harriet Jacobs, New Bedford was known. We had a reputation. So you have some of the most important uh, slave narratives that were written at the time were written with people who came to New Bedford. So you have Harriet Jacobs and Harriet Jacobs writes the most important slave narrative uh, written by a woman. You also have Frederick Douglass's narrative that's written. And you also have the narrative of William uh, Wells Brown, who's a first poet, first historian, who lived at the Johnson House, whose daughters lived at the Johnson House. And you also have, um, let's see, Henry Box Brown, who writes his narrative. And now what's coming out in January is the narrative of William and Ellen Craft, which is another group of uh, individuals who escaped slavery and become nationally known, but they were here too. So you have this whole uh, group of people and, and Tim, I'll let you talk about John and then I'll talk about Harriet. Sure, so um, John Jacobs is, uh, this is a story that, uh, that we were extraordinarily happy to be able to tell as part of the exhibition at the Whaling Museum. And it's a story that almost didn't get included in the exhibition, but uh, a colleague of ours and a, a great scholar named Jonathan Schroeder um, identified a portrait that was at the African American Museum of Philadelphia. And he had done a lot of background work and, and research and, and try to figure out who the person pictured in the portrait was. And he finally uh, was able to show with um, almost certain, almost 100% certainty 
that the person in the painting was John Jacobs, who was the brother of Harriet Jacobs. And he escapes by sea from the South, uh, ends up in New Bedford, goes to work on a whaler. I mean, he's sort of the quintessential uh, archetype of what we're talking about here because he he hits all of, he ticks all the boxes of all the things that many people who escaped from enslavement did. Uh, he becomes a uh, an ardent and vocal abolitionist. Uh, he is a mariner. He ends up traveling throughout, uh, around the Atlantic world. He is um, pictured in the portrait holding a copy of The Liberator, the, the newspaper, the abolitionist newspaper uh, published in Boston. And so he's making it very clear what his politics are, but he's also um, tied inextricably to this whole maritime story uh, because he uh, has the experience of working on a whale ship to make some money and to avoid recapture when he arrives in New Bedford. Uh, and, and so his, uh, his connection to our community is, um, on one hand, uh, very similar to other people's, but he's one of the best, better known ones. And we hadn't, we didn't know what he looked like until we just had this painting identified. And that happened literally weeks before the exhibition opened. So very quickly, once we found this out, we said, well, we got to, we really need to have this portrait in our exhibition. And we were able to arrange uh, to have a loan from the African American Museum of Philadelphia. And it became part of our exhibition. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very striking portrait too. I, I remember it. So the other piece of that story is that John Jacobs' sister, Harriet Jacobs, was very well known as an author. And her book is Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl and becomes one of the most important books because it's one of the very few narratives that is written by an enslaved woman about her life and also about what, what happens to her. Harriet um, is a member she, of the Grinnell family. She is the nanny to the Grinnell family. So also with John and with Harriet, what you see are the Quaker families that work with these people. So for instance, Harriet Jacobs leaves North Carolina, ends up working in New York, upstate New York, and she works for the Grinnell family. Uh, Cornelia Grinnell, her father lived right on County Street, and when Cornelia would hear that Harriet Jacobs' owner was looking for her, she would pack her up and send her to New Bedford. So there are all these stories of Harriet being sent in snowstorms, bad weather, to New Bedford to escape her owner. And the, the, the Grinnell family, uh, for, for those who might not know, is a very prominent Quaker. Were they, were they, were they whalers, um, Lee? Uh, I don't think so. I think they were factory, they owned manufacturing plants. Okay. And there's a great story about um, Harriet, I think this is before she escaped, having to hide in an attic somewhere that was very cramped. She couldn't even stand up. Uh, well, that's what her, her book is about, is her, her life and her uh, opportunities for escape, but also her opportunities for uh, what a young woman who was attractive, who was enslaved, always had to deal with the sexual advances of her owner. So there's a lot of kind of nuance about how difficult it was to be a female slave. And at the Victorian time, when this book comes out, those are things, not things people want to talk about, but those are things that happened all the time. So her um, experience comes full circle when she comes to New Bedford. And one of the families, you mentioned the uh, Piper family, Amelia Piper and her husband, William, become the go-between between between her brother, John, and Harriet. So when Harriet comes to New Bedford, she would see the Pipers to find out what she could about her brother's whereabouts and vice versa. And the um, Pipers are members of the Underground Railroad here in New Bedford but also have connections with the Boston abolitionists. Um, the Piper family, it's Amelia, it's William, their two sons and their two daughters. It's almost three generations of abolitionists who are working in the Underground Railroad. So th there must have had to have been a well-organized system for getting this girl, young girl hiding in an attic to this ship. There must have been people who coordinated to do all this. 
Well, that's why it takes her several years to get out of the attic. But she also is given a sailor suit and gets on a ship and is shipped up the coast and eventually ends up in upstate New York. Fascinating. To my, I, I apologize because I've interrupted you and I don't know that you had more slides there that you that you want to. Um, I can let me. Uh, yeah, let me jump back in. I just wanted to show a couple of um, examples of um, these are runaway slave ads. And uh, and the important thing here to know is that this starts very early. We have right. uh, advertisements from the middle of the 18th century right up until the middle of the Civil War in the 1860s. Uh, this is an interesting one because it's so local and it was published in a New Bedford newspaper. Um, it's not a runaway slave ad. Instead, it's a local captain publishing a public notice to give himself legal cover to say, you know, I brought an enslaved person from the South to the North, but I didn't have anything to do with it. He was a stowaway. And I want everyone to know, including his owner, that I was not implicated in his escape. So this happens right after the first Fugitive Slave Act that Congress passes in 1793. The ad here is from 1797. And under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, um, captains of vessels could be held liable if they aided and abetted an escape. And one way that captains defended themselves was to put in a public notice in a newspaper for a number of reasons. One, to tell the owner of the enslaved person where their property was, but also to explain the circumstances under which this happened. So this advertisement, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but if you read through it, it says that he the, uh, that he discovered once he had left a port in the South, he left the York River in Virginia, uh, and then the day after sailing, he discovers this stowaway, and he says, this person concealed himself unbeknownst to me. I had no nothing to do with this. And then he goes on to say, I couldn't turn around and take him back because the weather was against me. And I had to I had to keep sailing on my course because the weather wouldn't allow me to turn around and come back. And so he says, when I get to New Bedford, uh, I want the owner to know that his uh, escaped enslaved person, whose name was James, uh, is in the port of New Bedford. But the thing that we have to understand here is that this is a weekly newspaper. It would have taken weeks for the paper to get probably down the coast to Virginia, where the owner was. And so by that point, uh, the enslaved person could be anywhere. Uh, what and, would have been the punishment for the captain? Uh, for, 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 for yeah, so he risked imprisonment, the impounding of his vessel, the impounding of his goods. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, possible uh, punishments, including being forever banned from trading in that um, in in the state of Virginia, where the person had been uh, taken from. So the 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 penalties were were very serious for a working sea captain with his own vessel, um, and uh, and so they did everything in their power to to uh, stop being prosecuted for aiding and abetting. And then the last slide I'll show here is um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, the, last, the last slide I wanted to show was an actual reference to New Bedford in a runaway slave ad because the owner suspects that their uh, that their property, a, a young woman, Jane Pennington, who is about 20 years old, he suspects that she has gone, in fact, to New Bedford in the 1840s because uh, her father was living in New Bedford already. So uh, the, the, the name of New Bedford begins to show up in these uh, in these runaway ads. And amongst the owner class in the South, New Bedford became known as a place to which their property might be um, uh, traveling to. And so um, and so that makes it all the more extraordinary that no one was ever taken back into slavery from, from New Bedford, because it was definitely known as uh, a safe place, uh, both by owners and enslaved people. The fugitives, the fugitives to Brockton. Go ahead, Lee. The, the other thing is that the advertisements are placed by well-known people at the time. So you get to see the names. So the Tabor family, the Rodmans, the Roach Jones Duff, you get to see those names as people who hired black people, who protected black people. The Piper family and the Jacobs family were helped by the Rodman family. 
So you get to see some of the players and how they assisted the Underground Railroad by creating job areas or helping people get on ships. And one of the great ways is, is documenting, is looking at all these ads from the Evening Standard and the local papers at the time, you see that people are creating this whole network, a safety network of protecting people who are fugitive slaves. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, the, the, this discussion of the captains um, uh, reminds me of a, a person I, I saw in the exhibit, uh, Daniel Drayton. That, that seemed like a fascinating story from the 19th century and the, the school of the pearl. This, this, this person, Drayton, actually went to jail uh, for being caught uh, trying to aid in an escape. He, he went to jail for four years. Yeah. And the Pearl Incident, it's, the, it's often referred to as the Pearl Incident because that was the name of the ship. But the Pearl Incident, Daniel Drayton was trying to organize the biggest slave escape nationally. So there are 77 enslaved people on his ship. And he is, some people say he was paid by captains in New Bedford. We've never really found out all of that information, but it does become a big cause celeb for the Washington area. And there are a number of books that are written about it. But, but again, you have the same situation where the captain is, um, he's captured. You have 77 people on his ship. And what's gonna happen to those people? Those people are going to be sold further down south, so they can't use a ship to get away. So that becomes a whole story. Um, Drayton is friends with William Bush. William Bush was an abolitionist here in New Bedford, an African-American abolitionist who moved to the area from Washington, D.C. And after his four years, after Drayton's four years in jail, he comes to New Bedford. And in New Bedford, he finds a community that is, is willing to listen to him, to help support him, because, of course, after four years, he's lost everything. One of the important things to keep in mind about the Pearl Incident story is that those 77 people, many of them were the property of very powerful people in the U.S. government in Washington, D.C., so the plan is to take the folks from Washington, D.C., down the Potomac River, through the Chesapeake, and then get them into a free a place where they could access uh, a free state. Um, and so by, by irritating and enraging some very powerful people in Washington, this incident uh, resulted in rioting in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, Daniel Drayton was nearly lynched. Mm -hmm. uh, by a mob in D.C. because of his audacity in trying to uh, take these people from, from Washington. Uh, and it resulted in some legislation, too. I mean, the, the, the government acts to try to stop this from happening um, ever again. But it, it is the single largest attempted incident that we know about uh, in, uh, in U.S. history. Uh, before we begin to wrap up, I, I do want to go to a question that, that was written in from... Um, uh, gentleman named Ken Johnston. He wants to know how many freedom seekers settled in the New Bedford area and what years were the height of the free black settlements in the city? So, so we always answer this the same way, is that the Underground Railroad was uh, surreptitious. So their people didn't have numbers, but we can estimate. Um, the Historical Society has a list of at least 163 abolitionists, black abolitionists and freedom seekers, but the number is many more because not all the freedom seekers that came to New Bedford stayed here. They moved on, they went on another ship or they went to Canada. And there are lots of incidents where people came here just for a month or two and then moved on. So quantifying it with numbers is not always realistic. And so we don't really do that. We do talk about some of the numbers that we have. And when we do our work at Abolition, Abolition Row Park, we'll put up some of their names and we know connections from some of the other sites up and down the coast that are sending us the names of people who came from Virginia and came to New Bedford, what we know about those people, and we'll put those up. But uh, Tim can expound on that a little bit more about the numbers. 
Yeah, we, we do have a little bit of information that is that is useful for con, kind of figuring this out. One of the things we know is that of all the cities in the north, New Bedford had the highest population in terms of its percentage, a percentage of the total population, had the largest uh, African-American population of any city in the north, bigger than Boston, bigger than New York, uh, not in terms of raw numbers, but in terms of the percentage of the entire population. So in 1850, the... Um, the population of New Bedford is around 12,000 people, and about a thousand of those folks are African Americans. Now, what's interesting is that you know the the U.S. government does a census every 10 years. In 1840, prior to the um, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pretty high percentage of the African American population in New Bedford gave their birthplace as somewhere in the South. Right. You can be pretty darn sure that if someone was living in the North but was born in the South and they're African-American, there's a pretty large chance that they were born into slavery. What happens after that, though, is in the census of 1850, it was already clear that the Fugitive Slave Act was uh, about to take effect. And so people start to obscure where they were born. They change their story. And they also start to change their names at a, at a greater rate. So when people come to New Bedford, just like Frederick Douglass did in 1838-39, he changes his name to obscure his, his origins and his ownership. And that's a big reason why we don't have absolutely concrete numbers about how many people uh, are coming to New Bedford who were former, formerly enslaved people and who were fugitives from enslavement. But it is in the, in the hundreds, and people came to New Bedford. Some of them stayed, but many more of them moved through New Bedford and went on to northern New York or to Canada, and places where you know they could they could start a life. The and then the other thing is that we talk about it being surreptitious all the time and illegal. It was illegal to run away from your master. Your master had a right to come here, pick you up, and take you back. So that's a whole uh, reason why people, of course, change their name, change their locale. Um, also, they didn't want to have and be involved in the slave system. So th these people weren't their masters. These were their oppressors. So that was a, a large part of why we don't have numbers. What do we need numbers for? People were running away from oppressive systems, from people who were stealing their kids, selling their babies. Who'd want to be going back to that? So we have to wind up, we're over our hour. Uh, this has all been just incredibly interesting. Um, before we close, um, let me just ask, uh, Sailing to Freedom, Tim, uh, I know that exhibit is gonna travel around. Where, where is it now and how can people get the book and all of that? Well, I think a lot of it is actually at the New Bedford Historical Society right now, but the next place that we hope to have it um, available and, and uh, exhibited is in Virginia. Uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, beginning in uh, March, I think, or February of uh, 2023. And we have a few other places that are that have expressed an interest, including in Maryland. Uh, and we're hoping that the exhibition will travel to a number of places um, in the United States, maybe up and down the East Coast, maybe elsewhere. Um, but it's a story that we hope gains great traction because it's so important to appreciate and acknowledge this maritime side and if you're a Midwesterner or someone from, you know, the the, the West Coast, um, you're being taught about the Underground Railroad in a way that isn't comprehensive or isn't accurate. And so we would like to change that. It really, it really is. We have to go back to all this history and and have a new awareness and a, a new study of it because so much of it is different than than what we've been taught um, traditionally. Uh, well, just before we end, Tim. Tim and I had a conference on the Underground Railroad and the maritime trades. All those talks will be on YouTube starting next week. The, the other thing is that we will continue to do that. And we have videotaped the exhibit. So the exhibit will live as a website. So it's not just that we have all those pieces, they'll travel, but we'll have a stationary website of the exhibit and the six lectures that were given on the Underground Railroad, those will all be coming up. And uh, we were lucky enough as an organization to get a large grant to do that by the National Writing Project, which is doing 
a, a lot of work around correcting and addressing some of the historical inaccuracies on the Underground Railroad, uh, along with other things. That's great. And you can purchase Sailing to Freedom on um, Amazon for an affordable price if you get it used, because I did. So, so uh, you can get it there. Um, Lee, can you talk a little bit about um, the timetable for Abolition Row Park and what we can look forward to uh, coming in the next year? So we actually have construction going on right now uh, for another, probably another week or two. Once it gets cold, we'll stop. But the um, gazebo, the posts are going up. And we do think that Abolition Row Park will be opening up in May or June of next year. The cherry trees were all planted because they have to be planted in November so that they'll blossom in April. So we are working towards that. Uh, the other thing is that there are speakers who will come in and talk about the importance of monuments and uh, looking at how Black people should celebrate our own joy, our own history. And we will have, of course, the statue will be uh, here soon. And you'll all be able to see that with our young Frederick Douglass sitting on a coil of rope because that's what he would have sat on, on the docks. Well, it's all fascinating. It's great work that's being done right here in New Bedford by local historians. And, and we are really expanding our understanding and knowledge of the city's history and the important role it played in the Underground Railroad and American history in general. This hour has gone by very fast. Uh, uh, it is, there's way more we could have talked about, but it's been fascinating what we did talk about. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jack, for the opportunity to do this. And thanks to the New Bedford Light. Thank you very much.